Oman is on a mission to become a global investment powerhouse. Spending $26 billion on infrastructure upgrades across the country, spanning international airports, interconnected roads, major ports, and free zones. Building a resilient supply chain to export to the world and enable international businesses to unlock their potential. The location helps a lot. Uh, in terms of the outlook to the Indian Ocean, the proximity to Africa and the proximity to India as well, two of the fastest growing economies in the world. And of course, we provide a whole host of, in, of incentives, tax breaks, uh, bonded storages, fast turnaround of decision, lands at competitive price, of course, energy at competitive price. Its tourism industry is rapidly growing, with $7.8 billion invested here in 2023 alone. The country's natural beauty, from mountaintops to rare marine life in its surrounding oceans, makes it a year-round tourism destination, with historic landmarks and rich cultural heritage offering an added appeal. The tourism industry here is projecting more than 11 million visitors by 2040. Today, uh, uh, the contribution of tourism in the GDP is around 2.5%. And we would want to see this uh, grow to anything between 7 and 10% uh, by 2040. So this requires a great deal of investments, uh, whether from the private sector here in Oman, uh, or even the most welcomed foreign direct investments into this sector. Muscat International Airport welcomes up to 20 million passengers a year, and that number is set to nearly triple as the airport aims to become a critical hub for long-distance stopovers and a gateway from Asia to Europe and beyond. With direct flights to 93 destinations, a state-of-the-art expansion could see passenger growth to 56 million per annum in later phases. Testifying that, whether it's land, sea, or air, Oman is ready for liftoff. Connect to Oman, connect to the world. Please welcome to the stage, Mark Miller, Global Editor, Bloomberg Live Experiences. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Bloomberg's European headquarters. Uh, we're happy to have you here. Uh, I am the Global Editor of Bloomberg Live Experiences, which is a live events platform of the Bloomberg Newsroom, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today to our event on foreign direct investment scaling new heights. I want to thank our uh, custom content team for that beautiful video uh, that we just saw, uh, which, which was uh, not produced by Bloomberg Editorial. Uh, so if you're joining us here in person uh, or if you're here virtually, we're happy to have you uh, however you are joining us. Today's program as you might expect, is going to explore how international investors can best capitalize on the diverse economic opportunities of the Gulf region on a global scale. From foreign direct investment to global trade to logistics and tourism, the GCC is transforming into a magnet for international capital and a powerhouse for economic growth, particularly as other regions, including Wall Street, uh, are experiencing some sort of slowdowns. So before we get started, let's go through a few items. First, I want to acknowledge our sponsors, uh, ASEAD, Oman Air, Oman Airports, and Omran. We'd also love to hear from you throughout today and throughout the program. The Wi-Fi login is on the back of your badge. And you can submit questions throughout this program by scanning the QR code, which is behind me and is also located throughout the networking area. Uh, for those of you who are joining us virtually and want to submit questions, please click open the white tab on the right side of the video window, and you'll see uh, how you can do that. And you can also engage with us on social media using the hashtag foreign investment. And now, let's get started. Please, Please welcome, welcome to the stage, stage. His Excellency Eng Saeed Al Mawali, Minister of Transport, Communications and Information Technology, Sultanate of Oman, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Duncan Chater. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. 
Um, so I, I think to start off the day, we've got um, some really exciting conversations. And Aman has an a incredibly exciting story to tell. I think we could all see that actually from the video earlier. Uh, and is brilliantly positioned for economic growth, um, very much inspired by Aman Vision 2024. Um, so I, I thought it would be a good place to start to just ask you what your vision is um, and um, your kind of future goals. Uh, I think, thank you very much, uh, again. It's good to be here. Um, I want to start with what is, you know, what, is, what Oman has been successful at and, and why. It's about our, um, we are a seafaring nation by nature, and we've been doing it successfully for thousands of years. Uh, the reason for this is the location. So it is still valid today to use our location, be it for uh, logistics, be it for tourism, be it for any other activities that we can take advantage of. In fact, probably you know, very little known fact, but Omani ships has been going to China for over a thousand years. That is you know, a long time. It is not also an easy task then. It is a much easier task now, and it is a much um, um, needed task as well for the growth. Today, we are at around 5% when it comes to logistics in, in terms of the contribution to the GDP. We expect this to grow further. Now, if I you know, talk about what is my short term as you know, the person responsible for transport, communication, and IT for, in Oman, in the short to mid term, it is important that we sweat these assets that we've spoken about here. There is $26 billion that we've spent on this as a country. There are state of the art, one of the top 10 in the world when it comes to roads, for example, uh, 200 destinations weekly from our ports that can go and reach out to the world, about 80 to 90 destinations daily from the five airports, new airports in the country. So it is doing more of the same but sweating it to the end. This is actually the goal that we should focus on for the, first, for the next few years. Yeah. I like it, sounds fantastic. Yeah. How, um, what, what would you say the impact uh, is of your long-standing geopolitical neutrality, particularly around the um, economic growth opportunities? You see, there is something special about our region, and that is clear to, to anybody within the region or outside the region. We, for some reason, are, you know, uh, find ourselves in trouble in the region, time and again. Oman managed to navigate this and managed to navigate this for a long time and will manage to stay the same for the next, you know, hundreds of years. That comes with responsibility, but it mm -hmm. also comes with advantages. When you are in good terms with your neighbors, with the rest of the world, that helps you bring in investments, that helps you reaching out to countries that, you know, unfortunately are in conflict with each other, that helps you as well bridge the gap between these, these two countries. And, you know, in the process, you start also to make money. You know, it is, it is you know, it, it's not the end goal, but it is something that you can do as a result of this. Today, Oman, for example, is a gateway to Yemen. Yemen is in trouble. One of our neighbors is in trouble. Having us next to them makes life easy for them. It makes life easy for trade. It makes life easy to, to others as well. Um, I, one, one area we talked to, touched on kind of logistics and the opportunity there, mm -hmm. and some of this is obviously outlined in your um, Vision 2024, 20, uh, um, right through to 2040. Could you walk us through some of the ideation process around, again, the, the future opportunity um, yeah. around the logistics? Well, we need to understand that our economy, for a short stint, 50 years is not a, not a long mm -hmm. time, has been dependent heavily on the exploration, production, and the value chain of oil and gas. I think going forward, and, you know, the plans of the, the country for Vision 2040 is to also work very hard on the diversification. There are five important sectors that we have, you know, that the country decided to focus on, and we are going 
after. We're going after in, in our daily talks, in the policy making for the long term, but also in our relationships within the business community in the country or relationships when it comes to the business community outside or in the rest of the world. These five sectors are the logistics. Today it's at 5% roughly of the GDP. We expect it to be at more than 10% by 2040. Um, and you know that's, that's the goal for it. The fisheries, we've been a success because of our location. Again, it's just our proximity to the, to the Indian Ocean and it was, it's not going to change. Fisheries is another focus area, area, tourism, which is growing at a healthy pace. And there are the ingredients in the country for that. There is also a lot of work uh, when it comes to manufacturing and you know, value addition to commodities, goods, etc. And the country has probably, out of all of these sectors, this is the sector that received a lot of attention since the 80s. And successfully so, we've been able to transform the country slowly but surely there. And the fifth uh, sector that we're also uh, focusing on um, at the moment is the development of uh, mani well, mining. So mining is the newcomer. The country has pot the potential. And there is a lot of effort happening from the Ministry of Energy and Mining in the country. A lot of what we did not know is getting to get known internally and outside the country. But there is also an overarching um, theme, if you like, that is slowly s uh, coming into picture, but you know, rightfully so, and also important, and that is to go green, and to help the rest of the world to go green. If you've been following the news recently, there is a lot of signatures when it comes to the production of hydrogen, for example, green hydrogen, and that is because of, again, it is the nature of the country, the, uh, the you know, the intensity of wind, solar at the same location in many places, etc. Uh, the country has announced a very important target ahead of most countries in the region. 2050 is our target for carbon neutrality. And we are working on it surely in all the sectors. In the logistics part, our goal is to go to zero by 2050, just as, you know, but to go fast when it comes to mobility as, you know, especially land transportation. The program is, is moving fast. Uh, recently, we've announced a whole host of incentives for the usage of EVs, for example. One of the, I guess, it's even the only country in the region that have given these incentives, zero tax on, on buying these cars, zero on um, uh, import as well, and zero on registration of these vehicles. It has increased the number of vehicles in the country from last year to this year by 10 folds, and we expect more. The charging stations, for example, is, you know, now we've announced happily last week that, you know, we have charging stations from the north to the south of the country, and that's grow growing as well. We're working on the marine side as well when it comes to, offshore, uh, to, to shore power when ships, there's no reason for ships to have their engines running if they are in a port. If you hook them up to clean electricity, that's also going to help, and many other things. But this green theme is going right across all of these diverse diversifications um, uh, sectors. In the logistics part, the focus is to play our role because of the location, to sweat these assets, and to ensure that it brings fair, just, and good jobs to the country as well. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, uh, conscious of time, I'm going to just, I think the last question would just be, um, to recap a little bit in terms of the work that you're doing with the energy transition, the work that you're doing in accelerating um, logistics and certainly around the speed. How, what impact is that all having around um, FDI investment for the country and how um, it becomes a hub um, for now? You mean the green element of it? Well, both actually, both what you're doing around um, green, but also the work that you're doing um, yeah. so, focused on logistics. Right, so on logistics, there is a lot of movement in terms of investments. Naturally, there is a lot of work happening when it comes to uh, the, uh, the marine side. Always, Oman has always been successful at that. Uh, three ports has, and these ports have the, one of them at least has the deepest uh, draft in the, in the region and one of the deepest in the world. Uh, one of them, one of the other ports, which is also run through 
uh, a foreign direct investment uh, company, is the second most efficient port in the world uh, in terms of handling, speed of turnaround, etc. And then you know when you got, when you come to the uh, to the ports, there is to the airports, there is a lot of work when it comes to the foreign direct investment as well, successfully, and we expect more of the same. When you come to the land transport, this is the area and the marine the, the maritime affairs, which is a little bit different than actually running ports. Right. These are the two areas where we expect a lot of movement, a lot of change in the coming years. And this is because of the green element. This is also because of the um, you know the potential of the country when it comes to these things. Now, if you you know if we just take one of these things and talk about the location of the country, the the Strait of Hormuz, which at the moment you know mostly is you know um, it's overlooked by Oman actually, or, or it's 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 supervised if you like by Oman. There are sixteen thousand ships in and out every year, so that's thirty two thousand movements going in in a very sm small stretch. We have not you know, tapped into this, but we are now setting the right uh, policies that is you know, in line with the international law, but also that provides services for these users, the users of this, um, of this strait. When you come to roads, there is a lot of development change when it comes to organizing the, uh, the road sector, uh, sweating it as well by you know, ensuring that the, the road users get the best service, but also have the most efficient, or efficient and advanced operation in the region. If you look at the region today, this sector, for example, is not as organized as it should be. There isn't a lot of opportunities for triangulation that is done through science and through, right. you know, so we're adding th things there that are important, AI, etc., that will help also organize this better. And we're throwing the green element as well. So in terms of the light vehicles, mm -hmm. which does, so the, the, the road transport does about 18% 18, 18 of the emissions in Oman. About 60% of that is EVs. So first we're attending to EVs. Next is the trucks. And we're, we're doing a lot of work there. We've auctioned to the international market recently uh, a monitoring system for the, for the trucks in Oman. Uh, that is live, that uses AI for the purpose of first making this use more efficient, also ensuring that you know, there is not a lot of waste when it comes to carbon emission, etc. But also to ensure that the, this, the, 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 the environment for truckers and the environment for the, for the community that does trucking is the right one and the most competitive compared to the uh, region. So a lot of work there. Right? Lots of work. Yes. yes. Well, I think it's a, it's a uh, very exciting story, um, some great opportunity, and um, I'd like to thank you, Your Excellency, thank you for joining much. us. Great thank conversation. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Please welcome to the stage Ravi Bhatia, Director and Lead Analyst, Sovereign and International Public Finance Ratings, S&P. Sir Sherard Cowper-Coles, Group Head of Public Affairs, HSBC. Lisa Quest, Partner, Market Head for UK and Ireland and European Head of Public Sector Practice, Oliver Wyman. And Helmut von Struve, CEO, Siemens Middle East. For a conversation with Bloomberg's Malika Kapoor. Good morning. Welcome. Thanks. Morning. It's great to start with a packed house, right? Indeed. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. And again, a reminder, as Mark pointed out earlier, we have the QR code. So take your phones out, scan it. And we do want to make this conversation interactive. We want to know what's on your mind. So please feel free to send us questions. And we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. So we're spending this morning talking about FDI to the, uh, to the region. And I thought we'd begin by showing this chart, just so that everyone has some background and some context on where we um, stand with FDI. And you all can see it right here. So while you look at that, Sir Sherrod, I wanted to begin by um, coming to you first, both as a diplomat and as a business leader. You have a ton of experience in this region. And over the last say five years, last couple of years, we've had some extraordinary world events which have really reshaped the global order. How has the GCC's 
position in the world changed, if you think it has? And how does this play into the region's ability to attract FDI? Well, uh, Malika, what's happened is that the GCC's importance has become even greater than ever. Um, because of the effect on oil prices of the Ukraine war, because of the tilt in the global economy towards the east, the role of the GCC as a connector between east and west is more important than ever. And in particular, uh, Oman's role as the connector between the Middle East and the east. Uh, the minister has given us all sorts of extraordinary facts about Oman, but I want to ask how many of you in this audience have actually been to Oman? Well, not enough. <laughs> uh, you all need to go out there. You need to go out there on a holiday. Uh, forget all this nonsense about due diligence. <laughs> Just go out there and see for yourselves what a wonderful country it is that connects this great region, the great economy of Saudi Arabia, the Emirates now by road, soon by rail, already by air, already by sea, uh, with the world to the east as well as uh, the world to the south uh, and the west. Now with us today, uh, Arwal Belushi is just taking a photograph of me. Stand up. <laughs> She's the investment attaché at the Oman Embassy in London. <laughs> and then skulking modestly at the back is Michael Eiley, who's the Director of Trade and Investment at the British Embassy in Oman. So go out and stay at the achingly cool W Hotel or the Shangri-La <laughs> or the Chetty or wherever it may be. But before you go, go and see Arwa here and see Michael there. And then go and see Sa Saleh Zakwani, my friend, who is my opposite number chairing the Oman British Friendship Association, which is uh, the Oman wing of the Business Council between these we two We should great have had countries. you on the tourism panel. Oh, no, 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 the wrong one. No, Sher I've, Sheridan's making a live audition it's to all go on about the next tourism industry. It's because I was ambassador in Saudi Arabia. Yes. I know the Gulf. The great global bank for which I work makes more money in the Gulf than it makes in China. Mm -hmm. And that's a measure of the importance of this region. And um, I'm here because I believe in Oman. I believe that Oman is the most wonderful country. It is an Arab country with British characteristics. Uh, that means uh, people think British, they're educated in Britain, uh, they have British standards of efficiency, above all, British standards of openness mm -hmm. and tolerance. So I've said my piece, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm just delighted to see so many enthusiasts. And those of you who haven't been to Oman, book a wonderful flight. There's Sir John Chipman there, already thinking of getting on Oman Air, <laughs> flying first class out to Oman very shortly, uh, because he will be part of that connectivity between uh, Oman, uh, the Arab world, and uh, the world to the east. Well, the extraordinary events of the last couple of years, of obviously I'm alluding to, of talking about the pandemic and talking about the war in Ukraine. And uh, Lisa, let me come to you. I was wondering if you could weigh in and tell me how you think both these in particular, the war in Ukraine and the pandemic, have reshaped the GCC's importance, if you think it has? Well, I think absolutely in terms of <clears throat> the role of the region in the global economy and the increasing importance of the role in the region in the global economy. I think also the diversification of the investment opportunities. When we hear from the global investor community, they're very excited about the future of Oman, the future of the Gulf region, to present investment opportunities, not just in traditional areas, but looking at, as, as His Excellency mentioned, going green, hydrogen, where are the new opportunities to shape the new economy in the world yeah. order? And I think Oman and the Gulf's role in that will be incredibly important. I want to talk about oil, oil prices, because obviously that's uh, um, been a big factor, especially as a result of what uh, happened in Ukraine. So we can take a chart again. Now you can see uh, we had a windfall in 2022. Oil prices have come off quite a bit since then. So with this background, Ravi, I wanted to come to you and ask you, how is this, how is the, the movement in oil prices? What does this mean for GCC countries, given we are seeing a slight softening in oil prices again? Yeah, we've actually, we've seen ex uh, a significant amount of volatility right. over the last few years on, on the oil side. So first we had the COVID collapse, then we had a big rebound. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and then, of course, the war in Ukraine. And that led to an even further spike where oil went, you know, uh, uh, around $130. Uh, and then actually with a, a relatively soft growth in China, we're actually been seeing an easing of the oil price. So uh, it's been very vol volatile, to, to say the least. So that's a, a new, uh, you know, that's an aspect that the GCC has been dealing with uh, all along. Right. But in this new dynamics, it's becoming even more uh, complicated. For example, we have now, uh, you know, OPEC has firmly morphed into OPEC Plus, of which Russia is, is a key member alongside Saudi Arabia. But that has to be balanced with traditional alliances with the US as the security guarantor for the region. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that has also to be balanced with the fact that the emerging largest consumer of oil uh, uh, is China. So, you know, the, the GCC find its, uh, finds itself trying to balance all these forces in the wake of the, of the new reality, which is, uh, you know, the divide between uh, Russia, China on one hand and, and the Western powers on the other tied to uh, issues in Ukraine. So, um, uh, uh, you know, this is the reality on the ground and, and the GCC has been managing that. And uh, a lot of the push has been towards also growing the non-oil economy and diversifying into value add. Uh, renewables, petrochemicals, uh, well, they've been there, but they're being expanded. And then value add and, and uh, non-oil, hence the uh, sovereign wealth funds uh, you know, PIF in Saudi Arabia has really expanded uh, massively and in, is investing across the board. Their most recent impact on football and golf yes. <laughs> <laughs> can't be underestimated. And yeah. uh, uh, as His Excellency mentioned, I mean, Oman, its strategic location, uh, which avoids the Straits of Hormuz, is very important and proximity to fast growing markets like, uh, like uh, India and, and Africa. Yes. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's all changing. Uh, there's also uh, quite a large population uh, in the Middle East which, which really wants to live better. And the biggest change there is in Saudi, where really a big social liberalization program, yes, a program yeah. is really pushing demand for, for, uh, uh, for goods and for transformation. Uh, and the PIF is driving a lot of investment projects. Uh, so, yeah, there's, you know, it's, it's all Lots moving. Of movement. Yes, all indeed. moving, like you said. <laughs> so when you talked about diversification, of course, I saw all the heads nodding here. So we all know that that's really important for this region. Ahmed, I want to come to you next. When we talk about the region breaking its historic dependence on oil and moving into other areas, technology is a key area. Tell me a little bit about that and how much uh, FDI you're seeing in the technology sector in GCC. Uh, well, first of all, Malika, thank you very much for having me. And uh, as it was said before in your excellency, you mentioned as well, there is a huge drive towards diversification. Technology plays a major role. Um, we have seen this in, in Oman, we have seen this in the UAE, we have seen this in Saudi and other places. And uh, let me give you some examples. Um, UAE, for example, they have uh, initiated uh, a so-called Operation 300 Billion initiative, which uh, is uh, earmarking to increase the uh, contribution of the industrial side towards the GDP, GDP three times, so from 120 mm -hmm. billion dirhams to 300 billion dirhams. And uh, in order to achieve this target, what, what have we done? We have looked into the landscape of, for example, factories in the UAE. We have done more than 200 assessments of uh, factories to understand what is the pattern of industrialization that has happened so far and what needs to be done. Adoption of Industry 4.0, energy efficiency was mentioned. Um, uh, digitalization plays a major role. Um, all, and I think we come to this later, with the uh, umbrella of sustainability. Yes. How to deploy um, a diversification strategy and industrialization strategy in, in the Gulf region um, in, in a way that uh, helps to also fight climate change. Um, and we use, for example, we have uh, uh, just uh, been working with our technology on deploying one of the biggest vertical farms in the world. It's called Bustanica, a flight, Emirates flight catering together with Crop One. They're producing a million kilogram of, uh, of salad per year in this, uh, in this vertical farm, which is uh, um, uh, 
run with digital technology, they're deploying AI, they're saving 95% of water compared to regular uh, agricultural ways of, of, of uh, creating food. And that's part of the, one of the critical vert uh, verticals as well, where investment is going in, it's food security. We have seen what happens with supply chain disruptions um, where food security plays a major role, pharmaceuticals. So those are areas, and Ravi, you mentioned it. Um, we have technology, but we also have uh, ability and, and, and reach into very uh, talented workforce. Yes. The Gulf is becoming Skilled a very workforce. attractive yeah. uh, um, area for, for, for working. People are coming there, they see the security that is in the countries, and, and uh, they also see this as, future, uh, uh, as a place to, to live in the future. The reach into mm -hmm. India, the reach into other um, uh, countries, bilateral agreements that have been reached, uh, driving this and, and, and contributing to the attractiveness of really getting uh, FDI in, into those uh, countries that, uh, that are there. Yeah. And if I could just build yes, on one point there, so. because I think the point Helmut made is very important, but it's not just about the diversification and the investment in the region. Like the Gulf is leading investments that will have an impact globally, and I think that's incredibly important, both on climate and sustainability, and I think hosting COP28 is a huge um, successor in that. And then also on food security, on pharmaceuticals. I mean, the region is playing very much a global leading position on, on this. So Sherrod, I want to come to you next. Now, the public sector in this region is big. It's robust, right? How should countries think about balancing large public um, state-owned enterprises while they're also really having this push to open up um, to the rest of the world and encourage more foreign investment? Well, Malika, there are state-owned enterprises and there are state-owned enterprises. And what Mohammed bin Salman has been doing in Saudi Arabia, uh, what His Majesty Sultan Haitham has been doing in Oman, is to start to shake up the uh, public sector, to modernize it, to bring in uh, new management techniques. Uh, the big asset for the Gulf is a young, highly educated population and perhaps I could give a shout out here for the women of the region who are educated, who are major contributors now to economic growth. I worked in Saudi Arabia for BAE Systems. I chair HSBC Oman. I work with HSBC across the region. And our female workforce is at least as productive uh, as uh, our male employees from across the region. So a very big asset. It's no coincidence that the investment attaché here at the Omani Embassy in London is a woman. Mm -hmm. And um, we um, need to use that human capital to develop it, much of it educated here in the UK, uh, if not educated in the UK, at least um, educated to Western standards, and um, build on that. And there's plenty of scope for public-private partnerships, plenty of scope uh, in Saudi Arabia, in Oman, for young uh, startups in all sorts of technologies, not just fintech, but health tech, clean tech. Uh, we, see, we see an amazing energy there. Unlike other countries who've got declining, aging populations, yeah. this is overwhelmingly young, and it is a political imperative for the leadership across the region, not just to give these young people jobs, but to give them worthwhile jobs. These are educated, intelligent people who want to be challenged at work, and that's a big asset. The other thing that is different from you know, the public service, say, here in the UK, is that on the whole, it is properly paid, properly rewarded, mm. properly resourced. So people are proud to be public servants. They're patriotic. Not the case in many other parts not, of the world. <laughs> not yes. the case <laughs> in other parts of the world we can both think of. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm glad you brought up women in the workforce. I definitely wanted to talk about that, about reforms in the region. And we have seen a lot of progress when it comes to social reforms in the region. We've seen a great deal of improvement in women's rights, for example. Uh, Lisa, I wanted to ask you, how important do you think social reforms are in attracting FDI? I, I think they're incredibly important. And I think a lot of credit has been given to the reforms that have already been made. And also, not just with respect to foreign direct investment, but as Sheridan said, young people in the country want jobs that matter. Yeah. They also want to live in countries that reflect their emerging values. And I think listening to individuals as to what the countries are that they want to live in is, is very important. I think from a foreign direct investment perspective, you know, the investment community has certainly been buoyed by reforms that have been made. 
would like to see those reforms stabilize, embed across the region, and then look to increase in reforms in particular areas where they think that will be relevant for their investment portfolios. So I think everyone is you know, happy with the reforms as they are and would like to see that progress continuing. And I think good progress is being made and the right signals are definitely being made to the investor community. I want to talk about sustainability. I know how quickly these panels go, but I want to make sure we do have some uh, a chunk of time for that. Now, most GCC states have committed to um, net zero commitments. We just heard that uh, earlier as well. But many countries, actually not just in GCC, around the world still have a long way to go uh, to meet these targets and could well fall short. Will, if they do fall short, is this something that's off-putting to investors? Helmut, maybe I'll come to you with a sustainability question first. Well, I mean, it was mentioned before, sustainability in the Middle East now plays a major role. We have seen COP27 in Egypt, COP28 this year in, uh, in the UAE uh, being hosted. Uh, those are areas, and, and Oman is also driving with the energy transition that has been just uh, shared with the decarbonization of ports operations. So those are all areas that are extremely important, and they are really helping to attract foreign direct investment. because. No one company can do it alone. You need an ecosystem of partners to actually address those areas uh, that uh, do the, um, for example, uh, help uh, supporting the digitalization of the grid in order to um, in, uh, increase the share of uh, renewable energy in the energy mix. Um, you have transportation system. This was addressed uh, as well. You have EV charging, charge point operators, uh, a charge uh, network. You see electric cars being manufactured in the kingdom. Uh, they're producing uh, facilities uh, which were not, not there years ago. Uh, 150,000 uh, vehicles being produced in the country itself and then being rolled out. Uh, for this, there is investment needed. There, um, there is a whole ecosystem of companies needed, small, medium-sized enterprises, startup companies, uh, applying digital technology digital twin technology, um, the industrial metaverse is something which uh, digital savvy region like the GCC, they're very, very keen in, in, in not shying away of deploying artificial intelligence, not only on the government side, private sector, semi-government sectors, everywhere you see that this is a really, really um, uh, a focus area. And I think that, that is something which is really helping companies and, and especially the private sector, but also the academia. To, to see how they can uh, support this drive also towards sustainability, which is a very critical aspect. Ravi, I want to come to you next. Um, how much of an opportunity is sustainability for investors? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a huge opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and also, it's, it's one of the regions that has uh, the resources and the skills to deliver it and has all the pledges that we've seen, uh, you know, net zero by 20. 40, 2050, uh, 2060 is being pledged. Um, uh, and that's on the domestic economy and on the energy supply for the domestic economy uh, um, to move towards net zero. But then there's also the opportunity in the oil industry of actually massively reducing carbon emissions per barrel. And there's a big move in that direction. I mean, uh, the oil industry has been doing that uh, for, for a while, but that has really been uh, redoubled efforts in that front to, imp to improve that. Uh, and I think also the reality on the ground is, you know, the world is moving towards renewables, yes, but mm -hmm. as the chief executive of Shell just mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, you know, it's not fast enough. And so there is really, uh, oil and gas is still going to be an important sector for many years to come. Uh, and in the low carbon emission world, uh, what we're tending to see is that projects that are expensive, uh, you know, they typically have higher carbon emissions as well. So in, in, the, in the GCC region, we see that actually carbon emissions per barrel uh, are, are actually amongst the lowest in the world. So in, in a sense, the first projects that will drop out are the likes of, you know, the Angolas and the expensive oil and, and, uh, and the GCC is well positioned for longer term, even within the oil sector. Uh, and so it's this combination of trying to green, you know, improve the oil sector and also drive the entire domestic economy into uh, net zero. Yeah. So that's, the, that's I think, uh, the way we're seeing things uh, move across the world. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's not only a, a GCC phenomenon. I mean, it's, it's a global something, story. It's a global story. I mean, Norway, for example, you know, that is 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 looked at as a very clean economy, but it's also a big oil exporter, and and is working hard on on reducing emissions uh, per barrel. So that's uh, uh, you know the way we're going, and I, it, with with the growth of all the emerging markets, we really can't see an, uh, a complete move away from oil in the immediate future. So yeah. there's still uh, there's still some time to run, and uh, it's more about uh, you know cleaning the whole system. Pre uh, Malika, perhaps yeah. I could just underline what Ravi has said. The key word is transition. Yes. It's about accompanying these great oil and gas producers on this journey. I remember in 2015, the group chief executive of HSBC called me into his office and he said, Sherrod, what's this COP thing in Paris? Ah. And I said, well, it's actually rather important, Stuart. Yeah. It's about a change in the pace and pattern and direction of human economic development. And we, a great global bank, need to finance our oil and gas uh, clients as they move on this journey. And we need to make money out of it, of course, but we must not leave any one of those clients behind. behind right. And I, so I really want to endorse what Ravi's just said. A quick question for all of you, and you can see the clock, but literally, if you can come up with one bullet point, are there any barriers to investing in the region, to bringing in more FDI into the region? Is there one thing you think could, if you had to press one lever to really open up the floodgates of investment, do you have any thoughts on what that might be? Yeah, yeah. ignorance yeah. and prejudice. Okay, uh, yeah, People that's need fair. to get out there and see for themselves. I shock my Omani friends, my Saudi friends, by saying this is a revolution that's underway. Now, the word revolution in Arabic, thawra, majlis kiadata thawra, <laughs> makes them think of Kamal Abdul Nasser. <laughs> but this, the revolution, this is an economic and social and cultural revolution that's underway. It's being led by people like the minister here. They're not natural revolutionaries, but they are leading an economic revolution, a social revolution. But people here, particularly those of you in the audience who failed to get out to Oman, you're okay, behind the, the times. Back to the tourism pitch, right? <laughs> yeah. If I could, if yes. I could just yes. Yes. link Sheridan's point to his excellency, to wrap, but very quickly, I would say, yes. if yes. I could just link Please. Sheridan's point to his excellency, is I would say that it is the literacy of the of the world that needs to improve its literacy of the Gulf region exactly. and Oman. Yes. And we need to better understand the stability and the diversification that the region has to offer. Yeah. Thank and, you and so much. And the opportunities that are there. I mean, you have yes. smart cities being developed uh, in Oman, in, in all the other. It's, it's really the understanding what is happening and grasping uh, this as, a, as, a, as huge opportunities. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your time. I knew this would go by far too quickly, <laughs> but thank you so <laughs> much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, so thanks a lot. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to continue our focus on FDI scaling new heights and for the next 20, 25 minutes with a focus on global trade. So please join me in welcoming my next set of panelists. Haitham Al Salmi, CEO of Muscat Stock Exchange, Saif Malik, CEO of United Kingdom Standard Chartered Bank, Benjamin Wegprosser, co-founder and managing director, Global Council, and Lord Jerry Grimstone of Boscoville, former Minister for Investment, United Kingdom. Please. <laughs> Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for being here with us. Lord Grimstone, I'm going to start with you right away. The UK is working on a free trade agreement with GCC countries, and you are playing a key role in, in the negotiations. So as someone who's involved in all aspects of it, give us a behind-the-scenes look at what's happening and how it's going. What's the progress there? Yes, certainly. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to, to be here. Um, I think, first of all, it's easy to slip into lazy thinking and to think that the GCC is a strong organization and all you have to say about the Gulf is the GCC. Mm. Whereas I think those of us who have spent many years operating there know that actually the countries are very different in the GCC. Of course, there is some common heritage, but the aspirations are different, the objectives are different. So one sometimes is rather lazy and talks about the GCC will do this the GCC, we will do that. On, on a, I know one of the chief negotiators, one of the Gulf chief negotiators very well, and he told me last month that 
the GCC spends more time arguing amongst itself mm. as to what to put in a free trade agreement as they do negotiating with the UK about it. Because we have to remember that the, um, the Gulf is a, is a customs union, but the only thing which is common across the Gulf is goods and a common external tariff. They have no agreement on services. They have no agreement on the recognition of professional qualifications. So actually, it's a very limited entity. Now, I think the, the advice that I give my friends there is that you know, we have to be ambitious in these things. And one of the problems the UK has got is that the first two free trade agreements we did were with Australia and New Zealand. 32 chapters. This is like a Christmas tree on which you can hang many different colored ornaments. Mm -hmm. And these free trade agreements, they deal with, um, with labor laws, with women's empowerment, with the environment, all great subjects, but not something that the GCC yeah. easily has competence in. So we are making progress. I encourage the countries to be ambitious, but also those countries who want to go further than other countries should absolutely be allowed to. Where Oman's interests are different from um, Qatar's interest, these differences should be able to be reflected in side letters, side agreements, et cetera, right. et cetera. Because like you said, not all countries are, are the same. Um, so if I want to come to you next, and just to get some global context here, what we were talking about in the last panel as well is sort of the GCC's positioning in the new global order. And of course, in the last couple of years, we've seen uh, supply chains uh, around the world being disrupted. Uh, we've seen trade routes being remapped. How has this affected the Gulf, you know, in terms of creating new trading patterns, for example? Yeah, so thank you very much, and it's great to be here. Um, I, I think when I was listening to the earlier panel, unfortunately, they may have taken all our sound bites. <laughs> so we might, have to, we might have to come up with more. But I think specifically on, on you know, I think the, the global shift that we've seen yeah. on the supply chain um, uh, finance patterns uh, is really interesting. So when, as a bank, when we look back uh, over the last five years, uncertainty has become, we have to bake that in, it's become part of norm. So whether it's COVID, whether it's Russia invading Ukraine, which happens to be, could be a, a war that was in East Europe, but the impact has been felt all over the world, right? With yes. rising energy prices, ri rising food prices, uh, economies as far as Ghana, Egypt, you know, uh, Pakistan have, have felt that impact. So I, I, I think the, the global impact of, of all these uh, uncertainties are, are really affecting everyone. Specifically on the supply chain side, um, it, it is a very interesting one. We're a, we're a global trade bank ourselves. We see that. Uh, I was in China two weeks ago and I think we've been hearing about the China plus one strategy. In fact, when I was there, I'm now hearing China plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, because I think the diversification is happening all over. So the initial winners were seen to be some of the uh, Southeast Asian countries, you know, so yeah. Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia. But we're seeing that go, go further. You know, we're seeing the nearshoring, onshoring, friendshoring. Uh, and so I, and, and, I, and I see the GCC's role in this um, is, is a critical one because it is sitting at the center of this, this, this world that we live in, right? So um, I think as we see, you know, very progressive markets like the UAE opening up, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're been, you know, they have an open economy, uh, allowing free trade to come through. Uh, I think those, these markets can absolutely play a role. Uh, I think our friends from Oman, uh, who've been here for, for the past few days, I think they have a huge proposition to offer also, uh, because many of the corporates, the large corporates, many of our clients are looking to diversify. They're looking to go into the home markets also and stay there. But uh, I think the positioning of the GCC being really in the center of the world uh, gives it a, a really critical advantage, which should be taken advantage of. I mean, it should be, you know, yeah. should be used for, 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 for the benefit, you know. Um, um, and, you know, even m markets like India, which yes. we, you know, were not necessarily going to be seen as that, but they're benefiting uh, from some of the diversification also. And just a reminder to all of you to send in your questions. The QR code is there, so do, do participate. We do want to hear from you. Uh, Benjamin, I want to come to you next. We talked about diversification. And as countries in the Middle East look to diversify their economy, there is sort of a renewed push in new trade deals and um, trade routes, et cetera. Um, what are some of the new trends, you're emerge, uh, your emerging trends that you're observing? Well, I think what's interesting is that I think to an extent, the pandemic concealed 
the way that in a number of very important new emerging sectors, you have the GCC taking the lead. If you look at something like food security, uh, if you look at the, the huge in growth in food tech, both in novel foods, vertical farms, as, as we heard in the last yes. session, you have businesses that previously would have seen the GCC as a place for them to export and to take their technology are now actually thinking of starting and developing it within the region. So you have, uh -huh. uh, you, you, you see significant focus, for example, in Oman with a business called Microtechnology, a, a, a mushroom um, a novel food business. You've seen the same, for example, in Qatar with an investment in Eat Just, which is a cultured meat business. And you've got big vertical farming businesses in the UAE and elsewhere with, for example, interesting offtake agreements with airlines and others, again, as we heard in the last session. So I think that uh, out, of, out of the necessity of having to respond to the, obviously, the very challenging environment that you have for, for food production in the region, you've actually now got uh, the GCC taking the lead. You see the same in things like, for example, and this is an area that we're working in, things like e-gaming and in, uh, and, sorry, in e-sports and gaming. Mm -hmm where, again, you've got the GCC taking leadership positions in investing in, for example, the gaming business. The global gaming business is a $300 billion business. It's three times the size of Hollywood. And you've now got games being developed and grown in the region, which will be culturally sensitive to the region, right. that will be which popular with local consumers, and will be able to grow internationally. Again, obviously, a huge, a huge diaspora across the whole of the, uh, the, the world that can be in, uh, uh, embracing these kind of businesses. And then obviously in renewables, again, originally out of necessity, but now an opportunity, both to develop new technologies, but also on the demand side to, bring, to, to, to invest in, in, um, in local um, uh, autos, in charging station uh, and, and others, where yeah. you're going to see big changes and big shifts coming. Thanks, Benjamin. Um, Hetham, I want to come to you next. The Muscat Stock Exchange, again, in another effort to sort of integrate into the global economy, uh, you've taken a big decision, and that is to remove restrictions on foreign ownership, right? Can you give me an update on how that's going, where you're at? Um, it, is, it is not just the Muscat Stock Exchange. As in 2019, um, the Minister of Commerce has issued uh, a foreign investment uh, law, yep. and on that, it has dedicated that it's open 100%. It's not just related to the exchange. It's the whole, the whole country. So, um, and they have just specified certain activities that are out of the scope. And those activities are mainly the minor activities are uh, into the, the local uh, type of businesses, the smaller businesses. But the whole bunch, the whole uh, license, the whole activities are open toward uh, investors, 100%. And what we did in Muscat Stock Exchange is just taking the decision instead of, of the listed companies to open the investable cap to be 100% instead of 49%, which used to be earlier. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, the whole country is toward having a, a full 100% uh, ownership, um, along with the other programs that support the Oman Vision 2040. Along with that, uh, earlier this year, um, uh, uh, His, Maj His Majesty himself has instructed to uh, cancel the withholding tax on dividends. So uh, although that we do have a specific situation where all the joint stock companies are listed, whether closed or publicly traded. So the closed joint stock companies was uh, in, on a tax regime or the withholding tax. Now it's totally cancelled and the uncertainty on, on tax has been removed. Lord Grimson, I want to come back to you and talk to you again about the free trade agreements that you mm -hmm. are uh, working on. There have been protests here in the UK around that. And there are people, there is a certain section of society that believes you shouldn't be having these conversations because of concerns about human rights abuses. I just wondered if you could respond to that and should those kinds of conversations even be part of a business conversation? Look, I think it's absolutely appropriate that when you're having dialogues between countries, those dialogues take place at a number of levels. You go back many, many years, and things are kind of black and white. Somebody was either your friend or it was your enemy. Nowadays, relationships between states are much more multifaceted. So you can be a trading partner at one level, and you can be making representations about human rights, for example, at, a, at another level. And I think we should all do that. Obviously, there's cultural differences. There's other differences, and one can respect that. 
But there are some you know, universal standards, and it's good that we talk about that openly, not with rancor, but in particular, not thinking necessarily that our way is the, is the best way. And I do think in some of these dialogues, a arrogance has crept into the West, which makes the continuation of these dialogues quite difficult. difficult. And if one is to make progress, one, one has to engage, and I have no problems about that at all. Obviously, if you come back to the nuts and bolts of trade, um, if somebody is using sources of labor, which aren't market sources, and that is allowing you know, goods to be undercut because they're being produced by, and I'm not saying for a moment this happens in the Gulf, by effectively by slave labor, absolutely appropriate that that's not part of any form of global trade agreement. Mm. But one should be able to have these kind of discussions in a, in a grown-up grown way. way. Yeah. Benjamin, I want to come to you next. We're talking about a trade deal between the UK and GCC. What about a trade deal between the GCC and China? Well, yeah, uh, your expression says it all. Well, um, it's clear that China is taking the GCC as a whole much more seriously than it ever took um, uh, uh, the GCC before the pandemic. It's obviously very significant that she visited yes. uh, Saudi in December. It was his outside of his immediate neighborhood. It was his first trip since the beginning of the Because these talks the have been happening for a long time, right? They, they have, but I think the, the fact that he went there, and he took a huge renewed, business yes. delegation. Yeah. Uh, he, took a, he, he took a huge Chinese technology business delegation, which I think also shows the direction of travel. It's clear that the Chinese no longer simply see the GCC and the neighboring countries as a source of energy. They right. see it as a source of innovation, as a, um, an, as a source of ideas and a whole wide range of different business uses. So uh, it's difficult, as Jerry was describing, it's difficult for anyone to come up with, a, with, with, with an FDA, with the, with the GCC, for all of the obvious reasons that we discussed. Are the Chinese going to get there? Yes, I'm sure they will eventually. But, what, but, but regardless of an FDA, China and the whole of uh, uh, Asia is taking the Gulf much more seriously than it's ever done before. And if I may... Yes, I'm I just mean, coming this, to you next. This is yeah. a block that has 55 million people, $16 trillion. Uh, obviously, there's some big, uh, big, big countries also. Um, and if you include sort of the neighboring, you know, Egypt, although they're not part of it, but if you include Egypt, that population goes over 100 million. I mean, it's a, it's a significant player. I mean, today, trade between GCC and the UK is about 35 billion. I think that has opportunity to, 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 to double, right? you know, at, in, within the next 10, 20 years, especially on the sustainability front, right? I think that's where you know, Saudi is playing a, a huge role in driving that. Um, and so for us, um, you know, we, we've been in Oman for, I think, nearly 55 years. Um, and it's, it's a business that, you know, one that we are very, very comfortable in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the setup of it. Um, and we want to help drive the next phase of growth. I think yesterday uh, we had a, a delegation of, of CEOs who came to visit us. And we, we heard about the, you know, the great uh, vision 2060, I think, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which, which oh, so 2040, sorry, 2040, uh, which, which is being driven by His, His, His Highness himself. Um, and a cornerstone of that will be how to make it a sustainable growth, right? And this is where, for me, the GCC will really play a key part. Sorry, you know, earlier on you talked about the corridors. I see yes. now the, the GCC is creating, so the corridor between GCC and India is becoming an absolute active one. Uh, both sides. Hmm. Um, the corridor into Africa, I, I see uh, the GCC countries playing a very, very important role. Uh, and of course, into Asia, right? I think that we know. But, you know, these two, these two corridors, especially into India and, in, and into Africa, is one uh, that I see is very exciting. Um, and I think the African countries are also realizing um, that, you know, if they get the, their free trade agreement in place, you know, these can be very powerful blocks that are outside the, 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 the norms of what we know of on, on the Western side. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you want to? Yeah, it's, yes. it's good to mention that in terms of numbers, up to 2021 statistics, uh, China comes in, in top list of the trades between GCC and China, mm -hmm. then India, then Japan, mm -hmm. then it comes, I think, Korea and, and the United so States. China, India, Japan. So it, it's logical that China will show an interest. Again, back to what Benjamin has mentioned, technology and innovation is one of the, the new trends that happens in the GCC. And I wanted to go back to uh, what we talked about right in the beginning about the differences between the various GCC countries and this idea of competition between them or collaboration. And from where you sit, I wondered if you could 
comment on that and how either could spur um, trade and economic advancement in the region? Um, it's a fact, and it's my own opinion on that, that uh, the GCC has different scales in terms of economics. So if you take the uh, accumulative of the GDP of the, the whole uh, uh, GCC, um, Saudi itself will count up to 50%. Yeah. Then goes to, to UAE, it counts to 23%, so it's ha almost half of that. Yeah. Then the third one will be Qatar, which is half of that as well. So we are not in the same scale. Um, so that, that really pushes us to, to work together rather than compete, because competing will be almost uh, a bit tough. Mm -hmm. um, the competition that really happens, and back to Benjamin, that it's an innovation, the new trends, but on the, on the current scales, uh, for most of the uh, GCC sovereign funds are working together. That's a collective of almost 3.2 trillion US dollar uh, collectively. Uh, and uh, if you go back, 23% is the GDP of the UAE compared to the whole uh, Gulf. But in terms of resources, they have the highest collectively because they have three, four sovereign funds. If you add it together, it will be even larger than uh, Saudi. So the resources are not the same as well. So uh, on, on the terms of what happens uh, in the last two years, you can see the visits, the political relationship between the GCC has uh, changed totally. It's, it is now mainly not just uh, a political, it's as well a commercial grounds where there are a lot of uh, relations. And I believe logistics will be the top of that, uh, being very connective, uh, connective to each other. I want to come back to. Sorry, if I could just come in. It's pushed the countries to think about competitive advantage, exactly. which right. they perhaps hadn't in the past. And you're taking o Oman as a fine example of that. Um, Oman is probably one of the best countries in the world for the combination of wind power, offshore wind, and solar. Yeah. So, and that gives it a real competitive advantage. So, again, the important thing for all of us, for the countries themselves, for the investors, for the traders, is to see what are those sources of competitive advantage and how does one maximize them. Exactly. This leads us nicely into the next question, which is from the audience, and it's not addressed to anyone in particular, so would, whoever wants to take it, please do. How does Oman ensure its voice is heard in the Middle East without being dwarfed by Saudi and the UAE? I think Haitham answered part of that. <laughs> <We're gonna let laughs> but, you know, for me, it's about cooperation, right? I mean, I think that breakdown that we just got in terms of the size, I mean, you know, you, you're not going to be able to compete on some level, but I think if you're able to cooperate, you know, create a regional hub from a tourist perspective or, you know, from an airport hub perspective where, you know, it could be Dubai, it could be Muscat. I, I, you know, I, I, think, you know, I think the cooperation angle has to be there. And, uh, and I, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the GCC is also playing a very important role uh, from a multilateral partner perspective. We've seen that in countries like Pakistan, uh, you know, probably, you know, in, in Turkey at some point. And, and they're influencing, you know, they're going to influence policies. So I think as the, the cooperation gets stronger, I think the block becomes stronger as opposed to trying to do it each country at, at, you know, one, one at a time. So I hope, I hope, you know, cooperation really takes at the front of the uh, sort of the mm -hmm. agenda. I, I, I think Oman I mean, the has voice of reason, the voice yeah. of reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Oman has soft power that it doesn't deploy. It's a country that has a heritage. It has a history that goes back hundreds of years. It has a series of relationships thanks to its trading that again goes back hundreds if not thousands of years. So it, 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 it has an affinity and it has relationships across the globe that with respect to perhaps others in the region, countries that were created in the 20th century yeah. down to European politics can't have the same kind of a relationship. And I think that Amman should yeah. really think about how it uses that, 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 that soft power in that history uh, in the way that it can really secure the kind of competitive advantage that Jerry describes. Adding to that as well is Oman being a very stable politically, mm. um, create uh, a very, or eliminates a very high risk of uncertainty that happens in, with other markets. Fair. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very stable. Uh, the connection with the, with the GCC as well in terms of resources. So back to the GDB and, and the, the distribution between the, the Gulf as, uh, and again on the resources available. Like if we talk about the mineral, minerals, uh, we have only Saudi and Oman that really have good commercial stake of minerals. Uh, that's, that's itself a good sector to, to, 
to mm -hmm. focus on, where the other GCC will focus on trading. So it, it's we are complementing each other. Each country has its own way of, of pushing uh, the other country. Another question from the audience. How does Oman use their rising economic zones as a diplomatic tool to influence its foreign policy in the Middle East? May I come to you, Lord? Yes, Mr. but of course, the, one of the huge geographical advantages Oman has got, it's looking to the east. It's looking towards the Indian Ocean. And as we've heard earlier, again, this is a source of competitive advantage. So developing economic zones designed to maximize the utility of that is, again, one of the ways forward that one attracts investment. But there are many economic zones. Yeah. That's true. Probably too many. In the name yeah. of uh, yes. and, they're, they're, and the, yeah. the, the, ex the exponential growth of them is probably something that's going to have to be rationalized in the future. Because as an, as an inward investor and someone looking across the region, it is very, very difficult to understand exactly where you should be planting your flag, where you should be prioritizing. And I think if we think about the kind of things that in the future the GCC should be thinking about, it should be actually about thinking about the different kinds of coordination across these zones that it, that is going to create a single standard level playing field that all inward investors can benefit from, rather than this hodge, hodgepodge, hodgepodge at the moment, which is a little bit difficult to understand. We're yeah. almost out of time, but very quickly, I know we began by talking about um, the volatility in the world, a global shifting order, etc. And um, I just wanted to ask you, perhaps Benjamin, last word quickly to you, how do you build resilience into trading channels? Well, if COVID taught us anything, is that you've got to have resilience in your right. uh, trading channels. And the, the, the GCC, just out of its geographic position, there's no better place to start. And I think that, 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 that whether you're an inward investor looking at strengthening your position and your supply chains across the globe, or a local GCC business that's thinking of developing, uh, you, are, you, you are a resilient and strong and stable partner for airlines, logistics business, ship, shipping businesses, the GCC will only benefit from the recognition that the pre-COVID supply chains are never going to exist again. On that note, we're out of time. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you for the great questions. <laughs> right. I can get you that way, or we'll go back. And now I request you all to join us outside for a networking break, and we'll see you back here in about 20 minutes. Thank you.
Please welcome to the stage, Mark Miller, Global Editor, Bloomberg Live Experiences. Welcome back, everyone. Give people a couple seconds here to come back in. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed uh, the refreshments outside and meeting some new people um, from throughout this audience. So we're going to continue our discussions uh, around foreign direct investment by next looking at connectedness through the supply chain and logistics uh, industries. And we have a great group of uh, folks to discuss this. So please welcome to the stage Oscar DeBach, the CEO of DHL Supply Chain. Matteo Mancini, who is a senior partner from McKinsey and & Company, and Dr. Emma Martinez, who's a digital pioneer and AI scientist and chair of the expert group of the Global Partnership on AI. Please join me. Thank you all. So, um, Oscar, I, I think it's a, a good place to start with you because you're the CEO of DHL Supply Chain, which I believe is the largest um, logistics company in the world. So I thought it would be a good, a good start to have you give us kind of a macro overview of where our supply chains stand. I think we all in this room and outside the room experienced you know, the, the, I guess, fragility of supply chains during the worst of the pandemic. Uh, and it really revealed where some of the strains are um, in uncertain times. And then, of course, we're going through certain geopolitical issues, which are also leading to reshoring and potential deglobalization. So from your perspective, where are we now today? Yeah, good. Yeah, and, and indeed, I think, I think four years ago, I still had to explain what a supply chain was. Right. I, th I think by now, everybody wants to know how the supply chain is doing. Exactly right. So that really, Did you ever think that, we would be at that point? No, exactly. No, I, did, I would not have imagined that. But, and, and indeed, so, so where, where, we, where we are now in supply chains, and I think I, think I, I can build on some of the points that were made earlier before the, before the break, um, where you, um, well, one thing that is clearly happening is, um, uh, is what I call, um, just to add a new term, is omnishoring. Only sourcing, sorry, only sourcing, meaning that um, uh, our customers, uh, our partners, um, uh, would not no longer uh, place their bets on one single source point for any critical um, part of their products, mm. um, and that's effectively what you see happening. So that means that uh, whether you now call the China Plus or any of the other other uh, other names, it basically means um, it drives complexity of supply chain because it means that you have more sourcing points. Uh, to build the same thing and to, build, to move into the same supply chain. So that's one element that you see clearly happening. And yes, that also has to do with the geopolitical part. It has to do with all the unexpected things that might be, uh, that might be happening. So that's one, one element. Uh, the other element in supply chains, what you clearly see uh, is um, uh, the urge towards um, uh, more digitalization of supply yeah. chains. Uh, and uh, whether that is the digitalization as in data and using data, as in using more AI, which we're going to talk about in a second, um, as in using more robotic solutions to also make sure that we have a, a physical flow which is, uh, which is more, more guaranteed. So that's an, an element which you clearly see. Another complicator, uh, because this is a simplification, but another complicator is obviously uh, the big trend on e-commerce. Um, e right. Where, where e-commerce, uh, we all feel always think about B2C, but B2B is just as much there. There is no right. single company anymore that doesn't have an e-commerce channel, um, which has different requirements of a supply chain, because an, an, uh, um, it has less uh, stock points in the supply chain, and therefore it responds faster to, uh, to trends and to needs and to seasonalities. And it's another complicating factor of, uh, uh, of supply chains overall. And then the other big element, uh, which is obviously the sustainability right. um, element. And how do we decarbonize supply chains, uh, which, is an, which is a big element, um, uh, which is not necessarily, it's, it's a bit contradicting with some of the points, but data and sustainability are very closely connected um, as well. And then um, uh, uh, it also then has uh, sort of looks at new areas, new geographical areas. Right. Um, so, for instance, um, one of the things that probably is relevant also for, to, for today's discussion, uh, we recently closed a, um, a joint venture with, uh, with Aramco 
to, um, to create a, an, an, an entity that um, optimizes uh, for the energy and uh, industry sector in the Middle East. Um, the supply chains using better data, uh, focusing on sustainability agenda, but also has a, um, a big element of uh, automation. Um, so uh, to really modernize that supply chain right from the start in, the, in a new strategic area. And, and we'll talk more about that in a second, but that will begin, you just signed letters of agreement, I believe, and, and have some regulatory approval that will begin when? So that will begin uh, beginning of next year, uh, once we have all the approvals done and all of that. Uh, and then that will be, be setting up, and it, it has a first element of really modernizing the supply chain, uh, in this case starting in, in, in Saudi Arabia, but then from there it becomes a Middle East-wide um, uh, uh, solution. Right. Uh, we have similar type of business in Oman, which was mentioned earlier, uh, I've been there. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so, it, it has, um, uh, so it is a Middle East-wide uh, wide solution, right. which will start from January onwards. Uh, Dr. Martinez, you've, been, you've studied you know, supply chains and um, we talked a little bit uh, in one of our phone calls earlier about what the pandemic really revealed. Give us your perspective on, on how supply chains have needed to adapt and will need to adapt. Well, um, so that everyone is on the same page, uh, what happened in the pandemic is that we all discovered that the majority of the ports were analog and therefore uh, they couldn't predict uh, how many e-commerce orders we were all placing at home, buying all kinds of things. <laughs> and that the analog world is really tough to manage when you have you know, oversupply because you have no idea which uh, ships are coming, if they're empty, if they're full of things. Uh, it, it was, that was the pandemonium. And um, where artificial intelligence is now creating inroads is uh, basically serving the big change in manufacturing. Right now, uh, manufacturers want to automatize uh, between 60 to 70 percent of anything that can be predicted and prescripted. It's a huge percentage. Um, and obviously, uh, they are uh, in need of anything that they do build it with decarbonization strategies, which is how it is affecting the supply chain, it's affecting packaging, you have companies like Mondi, the largest uh, paper and pulp packager of the world, uh, now designing packaging with artificial intelligence to make it super effective. And you move along the chain and you get all the way to smart transport, smart ports, uh, the need to make them energy efficient. And artificial intelligence has superpowers and the biggest one is optimization. Anything that you can uh, predict, for example, needs of capital, uh, stock inventories, you transform warehouses from two-dimensional analog worlds into third-party fulfillment centers that receive packaging but never sits there gathering dust. You just ship it out, whether it's B2B or B2C. So this dynamism is really going to change the landscape of supply chain in the next five to 10 years. And this is where the opportunity is. The, the all uh, ports that traditionally have been handling the hubs are now going to allow the entrant of new parties right. that will start with a blank page of super tech. And that's the opportunity. That's particularly the opportunity, I think you would say, in the GCC in the wider Middle East, right? So. Yeah. Uh, Matteo, you're based in Riyadh yep. for McKinsey, so you work with a variety of clients uh, globally, I'm sure, and in the region. What what are you seeing um, as uh, the changes that are happening along this in these industries of supply chain and logistics in in the region? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mark, and then thanks for having me here. Um, there is a clear, I mean, there is a clear need of localization. Uh, if, if, you, if you take the agenda that the GCC country has, in particular in this case, for example, based in Saudi, in, in Riyadh, there is, there is a need of regionalizing and localizing manufacturing. There is, there is a huge demand, if you think about the construction, the construction agenda that, that the GCC country has, they have billions of dollars going to be spent over the next whatever, five to 10 years. Uh, and the need of local manufacturing and local supply is very, very high, right, from material, from uh, equipment and including human capital labor. So there is a big need of creating a manufacturing hub in the region. That needs come with, with, with challenges, right? Because at the speed with, where they are going, 
right? It's very difficult for company, for private company, to 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 keep up. So, for example, I mean, take the example of, of industrial city that are currently created, Neom in in yeah, Oxford, right. right? Or you take, for example, the King Abdullah Economic City close to Jeddah. Those become big cities, industrial city, which will have an integrated almost supply chain, shipping and manufacturing, at the very high standard, both in terms of digitalization, but also sustainable energy, right? They have they are designed by bringing sustainable energy from the beginning. So all of this agenda is creating a lot of pull from investor, right? Both private and and also other companies that, that want to take part of that journey. That will also help them to almost leapfrog from a from a from a as a traditional uh, type of, of supply chain and manufacturing to something which I mean only with, with green field you are able you are able to achieve. Right, right. I think that that concept of leapfrogging is really important to think about because they don't there are, you know aren't a lot of legacy systems and infrastructure uh, and they can build and, and these countries you know to varying degrees have a lot of cap capital to put to work as well as investors coming in. Um, Oscar, the example that you cited earlier, this new deal with Aramco, how does that fit in with what, what we're talking about here? Yeah, I think it, it very nicely builds on that point eh, because um, um, uh, what we will be doing there um, uh, is create uh, the latest of the latest, um, uh, the, to, to share some detail, those will be five um, very large uh, logistics centers spread over spread over over the, over the area. It will be um, um, semi-automated with the latest uh, uh, automation types. Um, it will have uh, uh, optimized flows between them, so you actually reduce the uh, uh, the emission. Um, uh, it will have indeed uh, from a data perspective, uh, we, because yes, we use data analytics and uh, we use AI to optimize um, already today. But that uh, we will use the latest. Um, uh, to implement there because indeed you have the possibility that we basically build it from scratch so we can all uh, use all the latest um, technologies and innovations that we've had uh, into that into that um, specific business and it will um, uh, therefore help to uh, to leapfrog the the supply chain management in that in that region um, to then connect to all the various projects we're having and um, as you mentioned that there's a lot of capital available so we can move fast um, uh, there's a lot of eagerness and, and uh, to will. get this done and will, will to, uh, to get this done fast. Right. And therefore, we actually see that there's a lot of opportunity. And if you um, invest in, in efficient uh, uh, supply chains, uh, link that to your point about, uh, about efficient ports and, and, and data, then you can actually create a very competitive environment uh, to, uh, to work in. So th this brings up, for me, the, the question of the human capital and the, the the people necessary uh, to certain degrees. I mean, many of the countries import a lot of their labor um, supply. Um, we know many of the countries also have very young populations, so there's an opportunity there to bring them into, um, in, into this uh, network. Uh, Dr. Martinez, where, where, does, where do you see, you know, is there enough labor, and how do they overcome some of those challenges? Um, well, um, in the GP, we have a specific working track called the future of work, and is how artificial intelligence is coming to automatize so much that eventually some low-level jobs or tasks will be taken over by uh, automated systems. The great opportunity uh, for me uh, that the region has is that it can be a test bed of what AI can do to make everything more agile without having to fire people, which is right. the big problem that uh, we have in the G7 and the G20, where yes, we want to put AI everywhere, but we have to take into account that you know there's tens of thousands of people carrying out these jobs and it has to be gradual. Whereas if you go to a country of the future, then not only you benefit from making tasks already taken over by machines, the population then takes over really purposeful tasks that are much more important, but also uh, the sooner you digitize everything, the sooner you start having historical data that will make your predictability and all the analytics you do much more infallible. Uh, because AI needs historical data, right. and AI needs real-world evidence data that comes from industrial IoT and blockchain. 
So I see a massive, massive jump in the next five years into the countries that, this have, that have this roadmap and they deploy it and then everybody trying to catch up. This is what we will see in five years alone. Um, Mateo, when you talk to clients, um, how do they see the, not just the opportunities, but the risks? You know, what are the risks um, of, of, of you know, coming into the region uh, that you see or advise your clients about? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, for, for sure, for sure there, are, there are risks linked to the say, ability to I say, deliver at the pace which the country has set up. The pace. All, yeah, the, pay, the pace of change is very, very fast. Right? And, and these require a, I would say, fully established ecosystem which you cannot only say, bring by, by having, for example, manufacturing facilities there, but all the supplier, all the shipping, all, all, all the ecosystem. So, so, so that requires a say, fairly, mature, fairly mature ecosystem which enable a company to, be, to, to, to deliver on the manufacturing side, for example, on some of the projects. So what are some of the big risks? I mean, for sure, number one, as, as, you, as you mentioned, is human capital. We are short of people. We are short of people at, at, across different levels. High-skilled engineers, typically, and also the ones that are mostly blue-collar that, that are able to deliver the project. We, we have done a study with around 10 million workers that need to be added from now until, until 2030. We need how many? 10 million. A year. Uh, uh, in, in total, in total. Uh, that okay. need to be added to deliver on this on this on this giga project. Right. So that, that's one. Number two, it, it's around it's, or as I was saying before, the the entire I say green agenda, which which links to the green material. For example, uh, uh, green copper, green aluminium, green cement. Those are some of the focus that the country GDC in particular know and also Saudi are pushing to. But there is not enough green material available in the world. Right. right. So how do you then build? I mean, that also ecosystem that enable I mean, you to, to deliver. So I would say human capital, I would say a bit more advanced green material, this is the one of the, the most biggest challenges. Oscar, the, on this question of ESG and, and sustainability for, uh, specifically, it, the, your deals with Aramco, obviously one of the lar world's largest um, petroleum uh, companies, is there tension there as you talk about building a sustainable logistics um, hub there, or how do they view it? No, I, th I think it, view it? there's not necessarily tension there. I, I, I think uh, because they, uh, Aramco themselves, uh, wants to drive that agenda as well. Um, um, uh, because in the end, the, the energy transition needs to also be driven by, by those that actually sit on that side. Just right. as we are an, an, a transport company and a logistics company need to drive that agenda just as much. So, no, I don't think there is tension. I think there's more, it actually the opposite, rather the opposite, because there's ability, there's capability and, and capacity and capital to actually make those things happen um, uh, over time. So they really are viewed in tandem, right? I mean, the, yeah. the, that you build sustainability Absolutely. into the yeah. equation, yeah. right? Right. I know, uh, Dr. Martinez, you've been talking and thinking about this sustainability question as well. Um, and from what you're hearing, what's your perspective on, on where that stands in the region? Well, we already see that the top 10 most digitized ports in the world are building everything with decarbonization uh, strategies. Um, also because uh, the 17 principles of the UN are, are need to be implemented by everyone is at the top of the agenda. But also that allows you to be a lot more energy efficient. But in the big challenge of the world is not going to be that AI will take the jobs or the robots. It's uh, energy efficiency and the water access. Right. And, and, and that's why uh, the supply chain is going to completely transform itself in something that we will be amazed in the next five years. It's geopolitics, everything coming into place, whomever has built. This reminds me of when in 2010, Mark Anderson wrote, software is eating the world, meaning we all need to digitize our businesses, and some people didn't get it, <laughs> and those were the ones that pay the consequences five, seven years later. This is the moment to really uh, to transform the supply chain. Right. Uh, we have a, a question actually uh, yeah. for Oscar. With climate change, geopolitical conflict, should customers just expect to pay more for shipping going forward? 
If, if they don't optimize, yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> because that's the but point. But customers, the endpoint customers, or, or, well, I guess, because the, the companies I'm ordering from will then pass the cost along to me if they don't optimize? Yes. Is that so, what you're saying? So, 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 so the, point, the point I'm making is that, is that um, and I think it builds on your point, is, is if you wouldn't change anything in the supply chain and you would just add to that the whole um, uh, transition, uh, to, yes, of course, then there's a cost increase, and uh, let's not fool each other. I mean, uh, that, that actually passes on in the supply chain and ends up with the end customer. So that will be there. But if you optimize, um, uh, the further we optimize supply chains, and the further by, by using data, by using robotic solutions, by, by using alternative ways of, uh, um, of, um, of building up the supply chain, you can cover a part, a part of that. So the world you're describing sounds great. Um, but are we actually going to get there? I think I'll let Dr. Martinez answer that question. Uh, we, are, we are getting there. We are getting there. Um, and um, I, I know that uh, the minute uh, some of the boards, some of the companies have implemented parts of the supply chain, the optimization was uh, incredible and the cost cutting, of course. Um, what I see the momentum is in to then establish the roadmap very clear deliverables, plan for the next 18 months. In 18 months, whomever is on this roadmap will start capitalizing on the investment. Wow, okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, coming today. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, so, for our last conversation of the day, one of my favorite topics, travel, tourism, hospitality, um, we thought we'd end with um, uh, something uh, to look forward to. We should, as someone said earlier in the event, all get on a plane and, and travel to the region. So I'd like to introduce uh, our next set of panelists, our last panelists, Marlos Knippenberg, who's the CEO of Curtin Hospitality, Manfredi Lefebvre, who's the chairman of Heritage and the co-chairman of a and Travel Group, and Julia Simpson, who's the CEO of the World Travel and Tourism Council. Please join me on stage. Uh, yes, please wait there. Thank you, thank you both, thank you all. Um, so, Manfredi, let's start with you because you have a long history in the region, in the Middle East region. You're based, I believe, in Monaco. Yes. At the, um, you have operations uh, uh, within the Middle East, and you've traveled there extensively as a, as, as a younger man. Uh, so tell me how you've seen the, the opportunities for hospitality and tourism change in that time span that you've been visiting in the Middle East and the GCC in particular. Well, I started going to the Middle East when I was 18. So long time ago. Um, my father had business there. I did my personal first business as a young man in the Middle East in supplying pipes to Aramco. And, uh, and I've been traveling there a lot, so I've seen most of it. I've seen Saudi Arabia as it was 50 years ago. I've been to Yemen. I've been to Dubai at its beginning, Abu Dhabi, uh, Oman many times also. Um, and I've always admired the culture of the Middle East. What I love about it, it is its authenticity. So I disagree with somebody who said it's becoming anglicized. No, I love that the Middle East is authentic. Authentic in the personality of the people, and you see how proudly they wear their own traditional clothes, and, uh, and the, 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 how they have uh, human relations. When you have a bonding in the Middle East, it's a bonding for life. So it's really, it's a different world, but a beautiful world. And it's not only a beautiful world for the people, it's a beautiful world for many things which are there. And if you look at it from the panorama of how it was and how it is now, it was a country with beautiful sea, beautiful historical sites, nature, and so on. And now it is a place where you go from Dubai, which is from a European point of view, Miami, because it's lively, or Vegas. entertainment, uh, fun. You have um, Abu Dhabi and Qatar with beautiful museums. You have Oman, of course, with the historical sites uh, from Salala to uh, Muscat and, uh, and the desert. Uh, then 
up the region in uh, Saudi Arabia. Recently, I've been all over Saudi Arabia. The, the Minister of Culture was so kind to uh, allow me to visit uh, with helicopters and everything. And we went from uh, the north of the, uh, the, the, the what is called Neum area, right. uh, along, all along the coast, uh, the Free Bays, Amala, and then uh, by helicopter we arrived at Al Ula, which was uh, breathtaking, the arrival there. I went to Jeddah, which of course I knew 50 years ago, uh, and uh, changed some for the worse because a lot had been demolished, and now it's being rebuilt. And uh, Riyadh, when I went there the first time, it was 150,000 people. Hmm. Now, I don't know, many billions, seven and a half million, so it's amazing. But the variety, I think it's, it's a fantastic place. Culture, tradition, food, hospitality, natural beauties, historical sites, new developments. The most beautiful architecture now is not Chicago anymore. It used to be Chicago. Now it's Qatar or Abu Dhabi or Dubai. And it's going to be also Saudi Arabia. Right. So it's a, it's a great perspective. I, I'm very enthusiastic about the region. We, as Abercrombie and Kent, we are discussing. We have a de destination management company, which handles people who go to visit it. We want to build uh, camps uh, for the moment in Saudi Arabia. We're looking at other things. I chartered to the, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia the cruise ship to start operating in the Red Sea, uh, cruising. It was a success. Is that through Crystal? Uh, no, or, it was or? Silver Sea at the time. Okay, right. Silver Sea was the only Seven company Seven, which right. not, did not stop going to the Middle East after the towers, September 11th. We continued. We are persistent. We support destinations, and we're not there only to take advantage. We're there always. No, it was a Silver Sea. I chartered a ship. Silver it was sea, a great success. Right. And they discovered that the Saudi population likes to take vacations in Saudi and, and get to know the beautiful places that are in their country. Right. Julia, um, give us a, a, a sort of macro perspective on the Middle East and the GCC. Where do you see the development of tourism and how do you see the development of tourism and hospitality in the last five years and where do you see it going? Yeah, thank, thanks very much for inviting me and well done um, to Oman for sponsoring this. It's, uh, Oman's a wonderful country and I've been there a few times. So the big picture on travel and tourism it's, uh, we work with Oxford Economics. We represent um, uh, world travel and tourism. We've got about 200 CEOs. One of them is Manfredi, who is our member. And we've been, for about 30 years, we've been looking at what is the economic impact and value. We now do it on sustainability as well to travel and tourism. So the big thing to say is that before the pandemic, travel and tourism was growing uh, constantly for nine consecutive years. Then we lost 50% of our value. And now, over the next 10 years, we're predicted to grow at double the rate of GDP. Wow. So it is a really massive growth sector. And the way to look at it is to say that one in $10 that's created on this planet come from travel and tourism. And one in 10 jobs that are created on this planet come from travel and tourism. And there are also jobs that are, we call sort of direct entry jobs. And we can talk later about the impact of AI. But one of the things is, as Manfredi was saying about authenticity, the great thing about travel and tourism and jobs is you might be able to do a lot of the, the planning, the searching, the looking, the inspiration, the booking, but people want authenticity. And the Middle East provides that, as, as Manfredi was saying. So the numbers are looking very good. And if you look at um, Middle East, we're talking about a business that's a contribution to their GDP that's worth about $450 billion. Mm -hmm. And we're expecting that to grow to about $600 billion over the next 10 years. So it's, it's, uh, it's got a lot of opportunities. So uh, what are some of the challenges, though, to um, getting more tourists to more travelers to, um, to, to the Middle East do you, that, that your members tell you about? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things that the Middle East are very good at and they've got much, much better at is things like what stops people traveling? One thing's of visas. <laughs> Yes. You know, so uh, the Middle East, Dubai is very, very easy. As you know, you can get a visa like that. Saudi Arabia is just in Oman have introduced new visa systems. So that f is the first thing. The second is you need to feel safe and secure. And those countries feel very, very safe and secure. You need those two things. Then you've got to have the infrastructure. So I think, in, in fact, at the minute, the Middle East is growing faster 
than a lot of other areas in the world, and it's because some of those things. I don't know if any of you have transmit, uh, transferred through Dubai. Um, it's been absolutely incredible. It's an average 13 minute experience, <laughs> which for some of us that have had not yes. such good experiences <laughs> right. in other parts of the world, right. and it's gone completely biometric. So there's none of these fingers. I'm telling every, all the ministers, I was at the G20, and I told ministers, get rid of these digital things. You know, Lots of people got rid of it after the pandemic because people didn't want to put their fingers on things. But it's all got to be biometric. We've got, a, you know, we've got great member like Vision Box that just brings in all those. So you should really just be able to walk through, and it should all be biometric. And I think the Saudis that we're having a mix are now thinking of also going entirely biometric. The other, what are the other challenges? Um, inflation, but inflation impacts on all of us, right. um, all sectors. The other challenge is sustainability. And it was very interesting talking about AI because often airlines, which basically provide our lift, they are, they, you know, they support our sector absolutely entirely and are part of our sector. And they've often been held up as a sort of the pin-up boys of, you know, destroying the world in terms of sustainability. But the reality is AI now and all the searches we're doing, the, in terms of a carbon intensity, is it is greater all our use of IT with all those great big data centers around the world that need to be cooled than it is flying on an airplane. Now, that is not to shame one sector against another sh sector. It's just to try and put it in context. And I was very pleased to hear about Aramco because we were talking to Aramco and the big um, uh, oil producers to please produce a degree of sustainable aviation fuel. That is the fastest way that airlines are going to be able to decarbonize at the minute, but it's not within the airline's control. It is the energy producers, uh, the big oil producers, and it's governments to ensure that governments give the right fiscal support to airlines to be able to, and to, to um, energy producers, to produce SAF. Uh, SAF is really important. We're only producing 0.05% of what we need. We use every molecule of it at the moment. Uh, but it's a big, we did it at the G20, a big shout out to governments to really prioritize SAF production. The Americans are, the Americans in their Inflation Reduction Act, I can never quite get my yeah, head I around that, yes. the name of that act, but they are um, prioritizing and there's a lot of investment opportunities and a lot of jobs in SAF. So it's a, it's a good thing to do all round. So Marlos, you're one of those providers on the ground and your company, Curtin, has an ESG focus how, why, why does it have an ESG focus? Why did you, why have you implemented that as a, as a kind of founding principle? And how does that play out in your operations uh, as you're expanding into the Middle East, as I understand it? Okay, so we're a lifestyle operating company. We right. have hotels, branded residences, service departments across the board. We actually started in the GCC for a very simple reason. When we started eight years ago, and we did just a bit of research, 67% of the generations was below 35. And to change and implement lifestyle, the kind of philosophy that you need to have the big boxes, the, you know, the, the good old brands that we all know, it's really hard in the European markets where pension funds are quite strict, where rules and regulations on zoning are quite strict, um, to get projects in that combine long stays and short stays, that combine working components, that look beyond the walls of the building that you just talked about, you know, the, the, the heritage. We're operating Al-Balat in, in Jeddah. We're operating Dartantura in Alula. But at the same time, we're operating a former film camp that was converted into something historic. But when we built the company, one of the things that was always important and that's part of our DNA is that we include wherever we are. So we're inclusive, not exclusive. We go by brand guidelines, not brand standards, which allow us to go into a market, go into a place and say, who's there, what's there, what can we use, who can we work with, which comes to the social part of ESG, which has been what we do. We only started talking about it for the last two years because it became such a hot topic. Um, and Why? You know, one, because of COVID and the, the green part of ESG, right? The sustainability piece all of a sudden started to, to, to fly off. The social piece is something that's so hard. It's so hard to quantify, it's so hard to qualify, it's so hard to measure, it's so hard to report on. Um, 
and common sense is not always what we use, right? So one of the things that we could see with our teams was, and definitely in the GCC, you know, if I, my head ESG is 23 years old, from the Bahamas right. with a German dad, lives in Germany. So she's two sides of the brain, right? One of the reasons part of my team, and Tail is here, is uh, 23, 24, heading up business development for, for Europe. One of the reasons brought these people into the team and not as, you know, make a coffee or you're my assistant, or but to lead is because to them is a necessity in life. But buying a water filter in the supermarket at 1.5 euros is not a commodity in the GCC most of the time. Here, the salary scales are still very different. The way that we recruit people is still very different. And we're growing that s out so much that we said, one, we give our ESG program a name. So we called it UBU, United Building a Better Universe. It has a butterfly, so <laughs> it's cute, approachable, understandable, because the moment you say ESG, it's very strategic, it looks great, but it means nothing to our team members. Well, and we have a question from the audience. Has ESG become a box ticking exercise? Is there wellness washing? Or what is the component of wellness washing in the hospitality sector? And how do you address that? It, you know, I think across the board, right? The, the, is it green washing or not? I think the mom, before we start talking about green washing or, you know, do we or do we not? Unless we talk about it, unless we start small actions, nothing is ever going to change. When our industry, right, the hospitality is a little slower in adapting to new anything. If it comes to technology, we're the last ones. If it comes to airports, they're the first ones, we go last. We just come whenever everything is done, right? In ESG, we can actually make an impact and an effort. But to Julia's point, right, unless governments define what the building codes are, unless building materials are much wider available. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to bring solar panels from South America to the GCC and you know create a carbon footprint. Unless we start working on it, and yes, it will be greenwashing for a while because unless we talk about it, nothing will happen. But it's really an educational process first right. before anything else. Manfredi, do you see your your uh, clients, your customers, um, whether they're on you know, one of the cruise line or taking um, part in one of the camps? Uh, are, are they? Are you seeing an interest in ESG? What what is driving? Do you think how much how important is sustainability? I guess I would ask um, in their choices about where they go and how they get there. So my experience is the following. First of all, if you want to do ESG, it is not about words. So there's too much about uh, you have to say something because it's politically correct, ESG. We were in Saudi Arabia. There was a lady, a top model. She started saying a speech, uh, well-being, um, uh, burnt out. Uh, it, was, it was embarrassing. <laughs> uh, you have to do the things that you believe in. So we believe in it because we're good citizens of the world and because it's our product. We sell nature. Right. So to sell nature, you must preserve nature. If you don't preserve nature, you can sell it. If you bring people to a beach which is full of rubbish, people don't want to go there. So you have to act to protect the world, the environment, and other things. So that is uh, what they think. So that's how we act. And apart from that, we are in communities, and we have to work with the community. So Abercrombie and Kent has a very large program of uh, sustaining the communities. We provide equipment for uh, making the water drinkable in Kenya. We have a hospital in Uganda. We do a number of these things whenever there is the necessity to help or the opportunity, because it's also an opportunity. And on the ships, we have we're now launching two new ships. I had a company called Circle C. I sold it. I'm launching a new one. And the ships are going to be at the top standards. We bought them uh, from a company which had gone broke. And we are relaunching them top standards. The new ones we're going to do are going to be all top standards. It's, uh, it's, it's a good behavior. And it's, uh, it's, it's also a way to develop your company. Now, people are willing to pay more. No. But if they have to choose, they will prefer the ones who are uh, better. So right. it's a cost that you have to carry. Marlos, uh, you mentioned um, 
the youth uh, uh, of your company, but uh, it's a topic that we've talked about here um, in different conversations about the, the, again, and you mentioned it, the overall youth of the populations in the Middle East, which is both an opportunity and sometimes a challenge. Um, how do you address um, the, the labor issues for your own projects um, in the region? Um, I would say mainly staying relevant or being relevant. And I think this is every generation has their, their problems or their changes. This generation at the moment opens 20 apps at the same time and average spend on an app is 20 to 30 seconds. So the expectation that somebody will do the same role for eight hours in the same position doing the same thing is quite unrealistic. And again, industry right, it's quite hard to implement multitasking just because it's a pure psychological thing. If I, you know, it's the promotion, it's this is my job, that's not my job. But what we're working on is really to create that journey where you almost feel in charge of the place, where you need lesser people or higher qualified people, or you take people that are younger and that you promote in a much faster manner. But I think it's not just a, a matter of, because today we still have so many people that want to work for us, we're not suffering that problem in our projects today, and we have 50 plus projects. So it's, there, yes, there is a problem. Yes, it's not easy. But also I think by just the classic way, you know, we need 250 people in six months and let's go fly to three, four different locations and bring people. That philosophy, mentality doesn't work anymore. It, it, Julia, is, it, do you see that among your members um, in that region? Um, the, the, the sense of you know, dealing with labor issues, are they not as significant as, as maybe I believe? Um, and and how, how are your other members approaching how they staff their growing businesses in the region? Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because I think the issue around labor is a very regional right. question. So if I can use the words of the developed world, which I know isn't, but you know, in Europe and the US, it really, there are some really tight pinch points, most definitely. Um, but actually, in a lot of these sort of younger countries in terms of travel and tourism, there is a lot of labor. I mean, in fact, the challenge is how do you train the labor? Right. So Saudi Arabia is doing a great job opening up various colleges and a lot of our members are working with them. You know, Hilton has established, IHG have established that are training places to actually uh, bring people on. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it really isn't so much of an issue there. But, uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I uh, definitely enjoy travel, and I look forward to visiting some of uh, your establishments in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'll go that way. Thank you, Mom, Freddie. In a world driven by connections, Oman beats at the heart of global trade routes, using integrated logistics solutions from coast to coast to bring every opportunity to your doorstep, connecting you with the thriving global markets through one of the world's fastest logistics hubs and the most efficient ports, making Oman and its ever-expanding operations a smart choice for global trade and businesses. Connect to the world. Connect to Oman. Please welcome to the stage, Ayman bin Ahmed Al Hosni, CEO, Oman Airports Group, Hashil Al Maruki, CEO, Omran Group, and Abdurrahman Nasser, Chief Commercial Officer, Oman Air, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Duncan Chater. Good afternoon. Um, so we've just obviously heard from Mark um, and uh, the panel on a great conversation around tourism. And I'm delighted now to have a fantastic panel where we're going to continue on the theme of tourism, but have a bit of a deeper dive uh, into Oman. Um, so I'll start, Ayman, I'll start with you actually with the question. Um, how is Oman 
investing in its overall infrastructure and specifically at its airports. Um, and what investments have you made to ensure that airports are ready for the surge in visitors? Thank you very much. Uh, what an amazing uh, event. I'm really happy and thrilled to be here. Uh, Oman have actually invested uh, more than uh, three billion uh, US dollars in the infrastructure of uh, the airports. Uh, there was uh, a big investment was done uh, similarly with the airline and the airports. We uh, <clears throat> have the state of the art buildings where we have code F uh, runways in all of uh, the airports that we run. We're running uh, seven airports in, uh, in Oman. Uh, those airports are actually uh, was invested in through uh, the government to, uh, to give uh, more competitiveness uh, to the country, to get more uh, reach uh, and, and uh, connectivity to the world, and to uh, also make sure that we welcome uh, our guests in the best manner. Uh, simultaneously, uh, as, uh, as you know, uh, we uh, also invested in people to uh, also be uh, in, in par with the, uh, with the new buildings that uh, we had. We opened uh, Salala Airport in 2015, and uh, Salala is a tourist destination. Uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Hashel will uh, speak about the uh, amazing uh, hotels there, and it's also a, a commerce destination. Uh, Oman uh, Airport, uh, the, the main airport uh, that uh, we have is Masqat uh, International. <coughs> Masqat International Airport uh, was ranked number uh, 97 when it comes to customer service. And we've done a full five-year plan to actually jump over uh, those ranks uh, worldwide. So from 97, we've achieved, uh, after actually we did a good plan, and the plan was uh, all being cascaded, communicated with all the stakeholders. So we jumped from 97 to 77 uh, in, in the old airport uh -huh. in 2018. We've shifted uh, on March 20th. I remember that uh, day because I slept 45 minutes at that day. <laughs> uh, from from uh, 77 to 26. Wow. Yes. And uh, before the pandemic, we were number eight worldwide with our peer, uh, uh, airport peer. Uh, unfortunately, in the pandemic, uh, we went down to 12, but our vision is to be in the top 10. So uh, this is our story. We believe in ourselves, and uh, thank you. And and it's not uh, the airport management company; it's the whole ecosystem. So, like, if you come to the immigration, uh, you rate the immigration uh, officer. If you come to the security, you you uh, rate the security, and that all adds up to be the best among the rest. Uh, <coughs> FDIs that uh, came to the country during the opening of those uh, airports was uh, almost uh, a billion uh, US dollars. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it adds up as we uh, uh, you know, talk. Uh, we have a new initiative uh, to uh, uh, open up the uh, real estate uh, development areas yeah. around the airports. Because yeah. you, know, you used to have uh, uh, airport city and city airports. So what we're trying to do is actually build a city around all of the airports that we have and we complement the city, not compete. If you see uh, the airports that were uh, selected uh, in, in Oman uh, are near the uh, seaports to leverage and com uh, complement each other, sea, air, cargo, and, and vice versa. So Salala Airport is next to uh, Salala Port. Uh, <coughs> Sohar Airport is next to uh, Sohar Port and Dukum also. So uh, it's, it's, it's really a good uh, combination that we had. Uh, thanks to the uh, wise vision that uh, we've really escalated up the, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, aviation sector. And that's why we have that competitive advantage now. Amazing. Fantastic. Um, Hashio, I'm going to come to you next. How, what makes Oman different, would you say, from its Gulf neighbors? And what's the kind of competitive advantage do you offer to investors um, that are not available anywhere else? I think you've noticed that tourism being said in every discussion and every session here. And that's been fortunate or unfortunate for me. I'm in the business of everyone. <laughs> but Oman really set it right when we talk about tourism. Yeah. The beauty of Oman, if we compare it to the region, and then we'll talk about globally, that it's a destination year long. 
which is not the same for our region being because of the climate. Mm -hmm. So currently it's the same temperature as here, plus 40 degrees only. So <laughs> bringing it to perspective <laughs> that we still have in Oman different places to visit. So it is uh, a year-long destination. Then uh, also uh, His Excellency was talking about our location. That's make also another uh, competitive advantage for us. The coastal, we have 3,165 kilometers. That's again making it more and more that we can offer. And then it's only the destination that I know that you will leave the airport, the beautiful airport we have, and then you will go for two hours drive and you will be hiking in 3,000 uh, meters above sea level. You will come back, another two hours drive and you will be camping under the stars in the desert. Well, that's within the same day. So this is one of few things that we can keep talking about Oman. Then the connectivity that we have as well. Two thirds of the globe reach Oman in eight hours. Of course, we can use Oman Air, or uh, th that's, that's something he would promote for. <laughs> but then also, as I said, that is uh, the connectivity that we have, the location and the location of Oman. So we have all, all, all of these, we need now to capitalize on bringing it together. Also, the, the vision of the 2040 set it right for us. So we have a true north now. We know exactly what we want to develop. We know exactly how we want to capitalize on what we have there and the alignment between all the sectors that you see here today. Amazing. Um, Abdul Rahman, how, how would you say, because I know we spoke about this a bit beforehand, actually, and I think it's really interesting, but how would you say the unique history of Oman has kind of really helped to shape it into a growing hub um, for aviation and tourism? It's a really nice story. Yeah, thank you, Duncan. So it's a pleasure to be here, first of all, in front of distinguished guests, and thank you very much for the invitation. You know, when you look back in history, mm. the wealth and prosperity of nations has been driven by trade routes. Whether we're talking about the great silk routes of Asia, or we're talking about the trade, wings, uh, trade winds across the Atlantic, those trade routes acted as the catalyst for development, for wealth, for growth between nations. Within Oman Air, we are essentially creating the air routes, which are the modern day trade routes. So we operate to around 50 destinations worldwide. We cover all of Europe, um, Asia, Indian subcontinent, all the major hubs around the world. Oman Air is facilitating prosperity and wealth for the Sultan of Oman through connecting people, bringing people together, bringing uh, trade to the, to, the, to the Sultanate. Now, Oman's got a really interesting history, actually. It's something that I, I, I really enjoy reading. Now, I don't know if many people know here, but Oman used to have its own empire, and that empire was based on trade. The Omanis were the pioneers of trade. The empire used to run from what is now modern-day Pakistan, down to Zanzibar and Tanzania. And I remember a couple of months ago, I went to Salala, which is a beautiful city that everybody should go and see. And there's a, there's a museum there called the Frankincense Museum. Now, obviously, Oman's trade was originally based on frankincense. And if everybody wants to try, uh, our lovely Oman Air crew outside have these frankincense candy. And I really suggest after this, you go and, you go and try those. But in that frankincense museum, there were two paintings that really struck me and sort of struck a chord inside of me about trade and the pioneering vision of, of the Omani forefathers. And that first picture I saw dates back to 1050 AD. That was before the Battle of Hastings and the Norman conquest of the UK. And that picture depicted an Omani delegation dressed in exactly the same way that you'll find Omanis dressed today, going to China, and presenting gifts to the emperor at the time from the Song Dynasty, using those trade routes. The other picture I saw was, was maybe a bit more modern. It was from 1840. And that depicted uh, another Omani delegation using those trade winds to go across the Atlantic to the New World, to what is now modern-day New York City, to present gifts from Oman. So history tells us that trade routes are critical for the prosperity and development of, of business, of nations. Oman Air exists as the, the national carrier to bring people together, to bring trade into Oman, to bring business into Oman with our wider network. And just like the Omani forefathers of the day went to China, went to the US, one day Oman Air 
as long as it's one world partners, we'll open up Beijing, we'll open up Shanghai, we'll open up New York and bring that legacy together. Fantastic. I love it. Well, and it also, I guess it becomes part of the culture that runs through the, the way everyone thinks as yeah. well, which is fantastic. Um, just, uh, I, I guess, a bit more of an open question now to, to ask you kind of what trends you're seeing from both um, leisure, leisure travelers and business travelers um, and how that's kind of then resulting in the growth that you're seeing uh, Mon, like what's the correlation and are you seeing that happen as people are coming into the country, is one driving the other? Well, uh, actually, uh, uh, nowadays passengers, uh, they're, they're always different than uh, what uh, normally you see like uh, 20 years ago. Now, if, uh, if they have any connectivity, they would like really to uh, make sure that they are down in an airport where they have facilities, food and beverage, uh, uh, lounges, uh, uh, internet connectivity, and uh, what have you. Uh, so we, you always need to, uh, to be ahead of the game uh, with, your, with your customer. I think uh, what, uh, what also Oman have done is uh, we themed the airport in a way to uh, talk to the nature. We have just uh, uh, a good the story time. I like to uh, always uh, say. We have three piers mm -hmm. in, in the airport. There is Pier A facing the uh, sea and the beautiful beach beaches. And uh, Pier B is facing the desert. Pier C is facing uh, the north side. So Pier A, because it's facing the, uh, the, uh, the sea, it's all with a blue color. And it's uh, themed uh, blue. Mm -hmm. And Pier, C, Pier B is, uh, is themed uh, uh, yellow with, uh, to, to, because it's facing the, the desert. Uh, Pier, uh, Pier C is facing Al Batna, where I'm from. And that's why it's green. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, I think uh, uh, what, what, the the, what the customer wants mm -hmm. uh, as a either a commercial, a leisure, a visiting friends and family, they would like to see the best service ever. They would like to have a journey where actually they come to an aircraft, Oman air, aircraft, and they get the amazing uh, you know, uh, service. Because uh, for me, the minute a customer puts his leg on the aircraft of Oman Air, it means that he entered Oman. And then when he leaves Oman Air, he needs to have some nice level as expected in the airport, and he needs to leave as quick as possible when he's arriving. So we try to you know, leverage in that uh, area. On the frankincense uh, that Abudi was talking about, we have a theme, like uh, uh, a smelling theme in, in our airports with, with all frankincense. So you go to our airports, you will smell this uh, amazing smell. And we are always talking to the five senses uh, in, in the airports. Amazing. Can, can I add something yeah, to that? Course. Because I think it's really important what, what Sheikh Ayman was saying. Um, you know, during the pandemic, everybody said nobody's going to travel. Businesses, everything's going to be conducted on Zoom, and, and, and we were just going to sit back and, and, and sit at home and, and, and talk virtually to people. But we're human beings. We are animals that need social contact and social relationships. And what we've seen, certainly from, from an airline perspective, is that tremendous resurgence of travel, whether it's be business or whether it's be for tourism. Now, the one thing that makes Oman very different to the rest of the countries in the region is we don't have any high rises. You know, um, I believe the days of people going to high-rise hotels to sit on a beach and then go to the mall in the afternoon is over. I think people want experiences. They want to experience something that's unique. Oman gives them that experience. And most of all, I think there's an internal feeling. And, and that feeling is to be at one with the world. And Oman makes you feel at one with the world. Yes, to add to yeah. this. Uh, the idea about experience is really what's now driving uh, what the customers is after. But also they want something different. And fortunately, I think we kept Oman as secret as, as it is. Now it is the destination. And when they come and they, they as in the morning we were saying that still people, they don't know about the country. But the moment they're in, I mean, and at last, that, 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 that's the feedback we hear. Yes, this is being hidden from us, and it is the heaven that we want to visit. So. Now we provide a new experience. Now we're providing uh, Oman differently. And connecting with all of the dots we're talking about here, I think this, this is the trend that people want to see when they travel now. 
it's very rarely where someone is traveling to stay in a hotel or to visit a mall. That's, mm. that's what Abdul was trying to say. But what is it that country can offer? And mm. if, if we just uh, the refer on what we have been describing here about Oman, I think we have it all. Amazing. And I'm conscious we haven't got loads of time left, but one quick question, because I can sense the amazing kind of collaboration uh, going on. So how, how have you all worked together and how do the, the three companies work together to kind of promote tourism? You're obviously doing it very effectively. Well, your story about the airline, the airport, you missed the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> that could summarize it all. I, I, actually, I actually did, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, we uh, need to make sure that, you know, we bring you the customer okay, in with good you. hands. So <laughs> I'm convinced. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyhow, going back to your question, mm. I guess, uh, look at this forum. This forum was done from those four entities. Yeah. We are actually mm. uh, uh, all uh, owned by uh, Oman uh, uh, Investment uh, Fund. And we do such events and other events together as to leverage on each other. Mm. This is one. Number two, I invite you, I told you, I'll say it, and I'll, uh, I keep my promise, I invite you to come to Oman because you didn't visit to Oman. Mm. And I'm uh, extending the uh, invitation to all of you to come and visit Oman. It's a lovely country. Yeah. You will really love it. Mm. You will uh, have a very good experience. As Sir uh, Sherard uh, was talking about Oman and how he loves Oman, uh, I hope to see all of you to talk uh, on the same language that he was uh, uh, talking on. Yeah. Can I add one word? To your question, what makes us work so well together, together with Asyad, there's one word. It's one word you feel when you get on an Air Oman Air aircraft. It's one word when you see how we operate together, and that's family. Nice. <laughs> well, said. Well, said. well, thank you very much. Um, it was a great conversation, I'm sold. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Duncan. So this concludes uh, our event uh, for this morning. I want to thank you all for joining this briefing on foreign direct investment, scaling new heights. Uh, we really hope that you have enjoyed these conversations. I want to thank um, our panelists and my colleague Malika Kapoor uh, for this program and for all of you for taking time to uh, be here with us. And a final thank you to our sponsors. If you would like more information about them, please visit the resources tab on the event website. Uh, and again, thank you all for being very engaged. Uh, to watch any part of this event, you can return to BloombergLive.com and view on demand. Now we have lunch and more networking outside in the auditor auditorium. So thank you very much. <laughs>